Thank you, ladies. Take your Bibles tonight, if you would, to 2 Samuel chapter 18. 2 Samuel and chapter 18, please. We're going to read verses 9 through 15 of 2 Samuel chapter 18, and we'll read the verses responsibly as we normally do, beginning on verse 9 and alternating until we end together on verse 15. And as our custom is, let's all stand together to read the scripture, and let's begin together on verse 9 of 2 Samuel chapter 18. Ready? And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went away. And a certain man saw it, and told Joab, and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. And Joab said unto the man that told him, And behold, thou sawest him, and why didst thou not smite him there to the ground? And I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. And the man said unto Joab, Though I should receive a thousand shekels of silver in mine hand, yet would I not put forth mine hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king charged thee and Abishai and Ittiah, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise I should have wrought falsehood against mine own life, for there is no matter hid from the king, and thou thyself would have set thyself against me. Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. And ten young men that bare Joab's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing now to the reading of our scripture here this evening. And Lord, we pray that you will continue to make our hearts ready, that we'll be prepared to receive the truth from your word tonight. Help us to focus, and Lord, help us to think now upon the special as it's sung, and Lord, put our heart in tune with yours that we'll have ears to hear what you want to say to us this evening. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. first fell in love with Jesus, I gave him all my heart, and I thought I couldn't love him more than I did right at the start. But now I look back over the mountain and the valleys where I've been, and it makes me know I love him so much more than I did. And I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over over and over again there's a hand that i hold on to through each valley and each trial there's a shoulder that i lean upon as i face another mile and there's a love that i can depend on it's fresh and new each day when with love my heart is overflowing, that is why I say I keep falling in love with him 
over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. Amen. It's good. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer and we come to the opportunity to open up your word and <clears throat> look at it together tonight. Lord, I'm praying that you'll help us to give you our undivided attention and not allow our minds to wander to other things that we may have to do later tonight or tomorrow. But Lord, help us to focus upon the truth of your word this evening and give you our undivided attention for the next few moments that we might... <clears throat> hear what you want to say to each one of us tonight through the message. And so, Lord, honor your word again this evening. We know that it will accomplish what you desire in each one of our hearts and lives. Holy Spirit, do your work tonight as only you can do it. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. The life expectancy in the United States declined in 2016 to 78.8. Six years. By the way, that puts America number 37 on the list of 137 countries. We're right between 36 Qatar, or Qatar, I think they sometimes call it, Q-A-T-A-R, and 38 Poland. So we live just a hair longer than the Polish God said it's not 78 years, but he said it's three score and ten years. In the passage we read this evening, a familiar passage to some of us, is detailing just the very end of Absalom's rebellion against his father, David. Absalom has rebelled against his dad and wanted to be, take the kingdom away from his father. David, as you know, left the palace and fled and uh, there's a battle that ensues, and though David has given instructions, as the one man was right to tell Joab to deal gently with Absalom, has Absalom rides his mule uh, through the woods, his hair, he had long hair, and it got caught up. And by the way, long hair on a man in the Bible is always associated with rebellion. It always is, every case. And it got caught in the oak, and it hung him up, literally. Uh, I remember Lester Roloff used to preach a message on that. He called it, the mule walked on. <laughs> and the uh, mule just kept going, and Absalom hung there between heaven and earth. And he's hanging there by his head, and Joab took three darts and put him right into his heart. And then his armor bearers finished off the job, and Absalom is dead. You, you would have looked, and some people, and by the way, David wept very bitterly about that was very upset of the fact he was dead. Others, if it had been our day, people would have said, oh, it's a tragic thing. His life was cut short. Or he died much too young. Much too soon. Why? Why did he die like that? How come his life was cut short? Well, Deuteronomy 5.16 tells us the answer. Would you look over to Deuteronomy 5? And verse number 16. Deuteronomy 5 and verse 16. If you're there, you can say amen. Deuteronomy 5.16 Honor thy father and thy mother, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged, and that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Honor thy father and mother. You know why Absalom died? He didn't honor his father and his mother. And he died before he should have had to die. You know, the first key to a longer life is honoring your father and mother. 
I didn't make that up. God said it in the Bible. It's exactly what He teaches. Your days will be <clears throat> prolonged. When your days are prolonged, the Bible, literally the word prolonged means to lengthen in time. I believe your days will be lengthened. Anytime you disobey, listen to me now, young people. And by the way, uh, old people too. Huh. Anybody, anytime, listen, anytime you don't honor your mother and father, you shorten your life. Anytime you don't honor them, you can, listen, go ahead, be a rebel. Go ahead, disobey. Go ahead, go against mom and dad. You can do that, but get ready to die. Your days will be shortened. God will begin subtracting your days. You won't live long. Go ahead and argue if you want. Go ahead and talk back to your mother and father. Get mad when they tell you to clean your room or do the dishes or get off the phone or take out the trash. Go ahead and get mad and say dad's out of touch or he's, he call him the old man if you want. But God's subtracting the days. Oh, it'll look like a car accident. Or it'll look like some other tragic accident that took place. But there's no accidents with God. The promise is honor thy father and mother that your days would be prolonged on the earth. That's the promise. I think you'd have to agree with me that in our day we've seen an all-out assault on the home. And it's masterminded by Satan himself. He wants to attack the basic family unit. It's the basic unit of society. Before God founded the government, He founded the home. And by the way, before God founded the church, He founded the home. The home is the basic unit of society. As the home goes, so the society goes. And we have homes today that are unraveling in America and been unraveling for quite some time because of the attack on the home, and Hollywood does its part to make that happen. You can't, I, I don't, I, I honestly, I don't think I can name you a primetime television show. I just don't watch that. But I, I, I'm told that you can't find a happily married couple portrayed on television anymore at home. The Ozzie and Harriets and the, you know, the, the, uh, Ward and June Cleavers are long gone. They're not around anymore. Now I want you to look at a couple of scriptures with me in the New Testament. Would you pick up Romans 1 please? Romans chapter 1 and then pick up 2 Timothy chapter 3. Romans 1 and 2 Timothy chapter 3. Romans 1, 2 Timothy 3. Romans 1, look with me if you will. Down at verse number 30. Well, let, let's pick up with <clears throat> verse 28, where the Bible says, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, that's where America is, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, <clears throat> implacable, unmerciful. I mean, there's a list of some of the worst sins you'd ever want to think of. Haters of God. Murderers. People who are malicious. Without natural affection. That means without the natural affection a man should have for a woman and a woman would have for a man. When a woman has an affection for a woman and a man has a natural affection for a man, that's unnatural. That's not the way God made us. And in the middle of all that is a sin called disobedient to parents. That's pretty, you know, you say a person's known by the company they keep. Well, maybe a sin's known by the company it keeps too. 
God lists that sin in some pretty rough and difficult things that we would say are extremely wicked. Disobedient to parents. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> this know also, verse 1, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. Here it is again. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, on and on and on. Right in the middle of all the sins that will characterize the last days is that sin of being disobedient to the parent. Listed with some pretty, awful, wicked sins. And so God is saying one of the worst sins you can ever do is to disobey your parents. He puts it right in the middle of some awful, wicked sins. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to get you to see that God takes this thing of obeying mom and dad very seriously. It's not something to be trifled with. God says you're to, you're to obey your mother and father. You're to honor your parents. And that honor of parents, listen to me, mom and dad, let me help you. That doesn't, there's nowhere in the Bible say, well, they turn 18 and now they're on their own. That's not in the Bible. They're, they're your son and they're your daughter. It doesn't matter what age they are. And no matter what age you are, if your parents are still here, you're to honor your mother and father. And, and if they're not here, honor the memory of their mother and father. A lot of times people think, man, once dad's gone or once mom's gone, man, now we can do this. We wouldn't do it when he's alive, but we'll, we'll do it now that he's gone or now that she's gone. My friend, you're not honoring your mother and father. And you can do that if you want. The Bible gives you the free will to do whatever you want to do. But if you rebel and you don't obey and you go your own way and you don't listen to your parents and you don't honor them, God says you don't prolong your days. You shorten them. You want to live long? Honor your father and mother. Number two. You want to live long? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. Go back to the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Again, God talking to His people. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Notice with me, if you will, verse number 40. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 40. Where the Lord says this, Thou shalt keep therefore His statutes and His commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. Notice, keep His statutes and His commandments, which I command thee this day. And when that happens, you can prolong thy days upon the earth. Look at chapter 5 and verse number 33. Chapter 5 of Deuteronomy and verse 33. Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that ye may live and that it may be well with you, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. You know what God says? You're going to live longer. You're going to prolong your days if you'll live your life as God says to live it. Pretty simple, isn't it? But that's what God says. Eternal life is not just for after we die. Eternal life is for us living now. It's a way of life now. Jesus said, I've, uh, I've come to have life and you might have it more abundantly. Not just after we die, but life right now. The Bible is the blueprint of how we ought to live our lives now. It is, it is not just for the hereafter, it's for now. The Bible says we're to live to give our bodies a living sacrifice unto God, which is our reasonable service. And the Bible tells us how to do that. How do we to give, live our life to bring glory to God? Glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. That's the blueprint. And, and, and if I follow that blueprint, I'll live longer. I'll prolong my days. If I decide I'm not following the blueprint, I'm not going to live by the Bible, I'm not going to do what God says, I can live that way if I want, but I will cut short my life. 
Guarantee. Notice verse 33 again. It says, you shall walk in, what's the next word? All the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you. You know, don't you love it? Don't you love words? Words mean something. When God puts a word in there, He meant to put it in there. Now we would like it, most Christians read that, that you would walk in some of the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you. Or they like to read it, I'll walk in most of the ways the Lord commanded me. But I don't, but I don't think, I, that, that word all gives us trouble. We like to take the Bible as, you know, uh, the, the smorgasbord where you go to Golden Corral and, you know, oh, I like this, I'll get some of this, and no, I don't care for that, I'll leave that alone. And people approach the Bible that way. Well, yeah, I like this, so I'll accept this. I think God's right on this. Nah, I don't like that so much. I don't think I want to do that. And so we don't take that part of it. And we pick and choose. Now, we don't come right out and say things like that, but what we say is, well, I, I think this is all right. I don't see anything wrong with, well, I know the pastor says this isn't right, but I, I don't think it's so bad. Boy, that's quiet. Hmm? You see, the end of Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, it says that you can prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect, what? Will of God. What is it for you and I as believers? What ought to dominate our life? The will of God. The will of God. The will of God. Every day we live, the will of God. What is the will of God for me? What does God say about this? What does God want me to do with this? I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Therefore, I'm to glorify God in my body and in my spirit, which are God's. It's God's will. It's God's will. It's not even good will. It's God's will. What does God want me to do? I live the rest of my life in the flesh to the will of God. I don't pick and choose. I want to do what God wants me to do. I want to say what God wants me to say. I want to have the demeanor God wants me to have. It's not up to me. Well, I'm just not, I just don't care for that. I just don't like that. I, I am crucified with Christ. I shouldn't be in the picture. What does Christ want? That's how I want to live. I want to live according to all that's written therein. Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Not some of it, Joshua. Not part of it, Joshua. Not most of it, Joshua. All of it, Joshua. All of the Word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, helpful for you and me. You can live after your will if you want. You can go your own way if you want. But you better get ready to die. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to get you to live longer. D.L. Moody was considered for a citywide evangelistic meeting by a group of preachers. And one preacher raised the question, why him? Does he have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? And the answer back to that man was no. But the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on him. That's the way it ought to be for each one of us. The Holy Spirit ought to control us. A father and a son arrived in a small western town looking for an uncle whom they've never seen. Suddenly the father pointed across the square to a man who was walking away from them. And he said to his son, there goes my uncle. And his son said, how do you know when you've never seen him before? He said, I know because he walks exactly like my father. If you walk in the Spirit, people should know it by your walk. They should tell you're a Christian by the way you walk not just by the way you talk. You see, it's not, it's not a matter of trusting what I think. I trust in the Lord with all my heart, and if I'm going to do that, what's the second half of that verse? I can't lean to my own understanding. 
That means if I'm leaning on my own understanding, I'm not trusting what God says with all my heart. That's what happens to us. In 1999, many of you remember this, when John F. Kennedy Jr. flew his small airplane from New York City to his family home in Massachusetts for a wedding. On board were his wife, Carolyn, and Caroline, I believe, and her sister. Though Kennedy was a licensed pilot, pilot, he hadn't been approved yet for instrument flight, where, where that is, you only use the instruments, you don't use visual sight. Their takeoff was delayed until after dark, and he should have waited for daylight or sought a more experienced pilot to help. But he took off into the darkness, and as we know, the plane never reached its destination, and all three passengers were killed in the crash. Investigators determined that the crash was likely caused by disorientation from flying over open water at night without any landmarks or visible horizon. His lack of experience as a pilot might have led him to trust what he thought he was seeing more than what the instrument panel was telling him. And isn't that so true of the believer? How, 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 what a struggle is at times to want to believe what our heart is telling us, what our soul is telling us, instead of what God's words tells us. Instead of going by the instrument panel and flying the way God tells us to fly. Instead, we want to go by sight instead of go by faith. We face temptation and we want to walk by sight and not by faith. But it's faith in God. It's faith in His Word. It's obeying His Word that keeps us from crashing. It keeps us from ruin. Human reasoning will fail us at times. But God never fails. His Word never fails. It's a sure thing. His Word will keep us right on course as long as we obey it. You can disobey if you want. You can can live live any way you want. I tell people when they get saved, I say, really, you have... You you, uh, you know, when I, when I give them assurance of their salvation, I always tell them, you know, now that you're saved, in fact, I ask if they have children usually. And if they say, yeah, I have, I've got a daughter, I've got a son, okay. Now, here's the thing. That daughter has two choices. She can grow up to make you very pleased that she's your daughter. People could mention her name and you'd say, that's my daughter. Or she could grow up to make you ashamed that she's your daughter. She might commit crimes. She might do terrible things. And when somebody brings her name up, you'd have to kind of hang your head and say, yeah, that's my daughter. But you know what you can't change? She's your daughter. Because she was born to you. Well, you were born, born again by faith in Jesus Christ into God's family. You have two choices. You can so live your life that God will look down and they'll mention your name and God will say, that's my son. That's my daughter. I'm pleased with them. You can also so live your life that God will be ashamed. And he'd hang his head and say, yeah, that's my son. That's my daughter. You see, the Bible over in 1 John says he's not ashamed to be called their God. I don't want God to be ashamed to be called my father. So I want to live the way the Bible tells me to live. What do you give us the Bible for? Oh, the Bible tells tell you how to go to heaven, but most of the Bible and most of the New Testament is written to believers, telling us how to live to please God. So if I want to prolong my life, I want to keep all the commandments of God's Word. I want to live as God tells me to live. So I honor my father and mother. I live as God says to live. And then number three, Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. And look with me please at verse 18. Deuteronomy 11 verse 18. Where the Bible says, Therefore shall ye lay up these words, these my words in your heart and in your soul. And bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they be as frontlets between your eyes. And ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, 
and when thou risest up. And thou shalt write them upon the doorpost of thine house and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. God says, I'll multiply your days, I'll prolong your days if you love the Bible. Isn't that, isn't God good? He makes it so easy for us. And makes it so reachable for each one of us. Lay up these words. Lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul. And the way you do that is he gives, he tells you how you're going to do that. You're going to bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontless between your eyes and you teach them your children. You'll speak of them. Hey, keep it before you at all times. That's what he's saying. Has frontless between your eyes. That means when you get up, why not have some Bible, a Bible verse on the mirror that you look at in the morning? Why not have a Bible verse on the refrigerator when you open it in the morning? Why not have a Bible verse on your dashboard when you get in your car in the morning? Keep it as right before your eyes at different places you go and you'll look. Keep the Word of God there. Keep it before you. The way you get it into your heart and into your soul is it has to be in, coming in you all the time. And it'll get into your heart and into your soul. He says not only that, you teach them to your children. Speaking of them, talk about the Word of God. Teach it to somebody else. Teach it to your children. And when should you do that? Well, when you're sitting in your house, when you're walking by the way, when you're lying down, and when you rise up. I think that pretty well covers it. Don't you? I don't know when it is that you're not going to be talking about the Word of God or thinking about the Word of God. Write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates. Saying, fill your mind, fill your soul with the truths of the Word of God. He's saying, love the Bible. Read the Bible. Study the Bible. Memorize the Bible. So you can meditate on the Bible. Talk about the Bible. Listen to the Bible. And God says, if you do, you'll live longer. You'll live longer if you do. He told the Israelite to, to write it on the doorposts and write it on the walls of the house so that everywhere you go, you're filled with the Word of God. I, I think coming up this week, I think it's this week. There's a message on radio that's going to talk about the devil's blessing and the Lord's blessings, I think. And you know, I, you've heard me say this before. I've never had somebody come to the office or say, I need to see you. I need to talk to you, Pastor. And say, I'm just, I'm just anxious. I have anxiety attacks. I, I just get so nervous and I get so upset. My heart races. I, I, I just think I'm reading the Bible too much. I just think I'm spending too much time in prayer. I just think it's, uh, I'm just getting too much, I'm just, I'm going to church too faithfully. No, it never happens that way. But it never has. And coming up this year in 36 years, it never happens that way. It's those who want to go their own way. So you can give your time to the TV if you want. The computer, the phone, the magazines, the radio, the tablets. And, and neglect the Bible but you're cutting years off your life. And while I'm here, let me remind you, children, teenagers, the Bible's for you too. The Bible's for you too. I think as soon as a child's able to read, they ought to be reading the Bible. And mom and dad, you ought to make it their habit that they get up in the morning, they read the Bible. It just ought to be part of the routine. Don't. Don't neglect the only book that God's ever written. Billy Sunday said if, if medical doctors knew as much about medicine as most Christians know about the Bible, they'd be sued for malpractice. That was a few years ago. But I would say it hasn't improved much. 
Most Christians, when they get together, they like talking about this or that or the other thing. But boy, when you start talking about the Bible, they tense up. It's not something they feel comfortable talking about. But you should. If you love the Word of God. The choice is yours. Suppose you were blinded in an accident. I thought about that. Brother Chuck, that fellow that you guys knew, who just by that, you know, that two by four, bam, knocked his eye, and now he's blind, isn't he? He can't see out of either eye. All of a sudden, the man who taught Sunday school for years, and now, but you know what? You know, the only Bible he has is the Bible he hid in his heart. If that happened to you, how much Bible would you have tomorrow? Which Bible would you be able to keep with you? Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. How long do you want to live? John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, said, I, I am never out of my Bible. John Wesley said, I'm a man of one book. George Mueller, who we admire for his faith and his prayer and all the things that God did in answer to his prayer, he said, the first three years after my conversion, I neglected the Word of God. But since I began to search it diligently, the blessings have been wonderful. I've read the Bible through at this time. He said, I've read the Bible through 100 times and always with increasing delight. Before he passed away, he had read the Bible through 200 times. Don Bunyan, he wrote Pilgrim's Progress, testified. He said this, read the Bible, read it again, do not despair of help to understand something of the will and the mind of God, though you think they are fast locked up from you. Don't trouble yourself, though you may not have commentaries or expositions. Pray and read, read and pray. A little from God is better than a great deal from man. A little from God is better than a great deal from man. I feel one of the, one of the harms of our day is and, and I'm not opposed to them. I'm not preaching against them. Devotional books and things. But don't rely on the devotional book and neglect God's Word. It's great to get a little nugget from somebody and to read somebody's devotional book and help you. But listen, don't take that and say, okay, I've had God's Word. No, you had what somebody said about God's Word. Why don't you see what God wants to say to you? Why don't you see what God wants to speak to your heart about? A little from God is better than a lot from man. We do all we can to prolong life, don't we? And despite amazing advancements in medical technology, the death rate remains the same. One out of one die. Let me ask you a question. How's your life tonight? Going to live a long time? Or is God subtracting the days? You're honoring your father and your mother? Obeying your parents? How are you treating your mom and dad? What about your living? Your life? Living God's way? Living your way? Doing what God wants? Or doing what you want? Your will? Or God's will? How about the Bible? What does it mean to you? How, how long have you been saved? How many times have you been through the Bible? How much have you made of it in your life? If you're guilty on any one of those, I wouldn't insure you. You're not a good risk. Your days are numbered. Now, I could drop dead tonight of a heart attack. I don't know. But I don't think so. I don't worry about it. I had a birthday this last week. Don't say amen to that. <laughs> turn, turn 60. I don't feel 60. 70 maybe, but not 60. No, I don't feel 60. 
I, I really believe I'll live till Jesus comes. Or at least till I get three score and ten in. And it's, and it's pretty simple. Because I've tried to honor my father and mother. I've tried to live my life God's way, not my way. And I try to love God's word. And God said if I do that, he'll prolong my days. So I tell my wife, just keep that insurance policy tucked away. You won't need it. I'm going to be around for a while. I'm worth more to her dead than alive, but I don't like to tell her that. <laughs> Let's live life God's way, amen? That's the way to prolong your days. Prolong your life. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for making it so clear and plain in the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us and to know how we can prolong our days on earth and be more effective in reaching others for Christ, living a life that brings honor and glory to Your name and to You. And Lord, tonight I'm asking You to speak to our hearts. I believe You already have. Children, teenagers, young adults, to adults. I pray, Lord, that we've honored our mother and father, which is that first commandment with promise, that it would be well with thee and that our days would be prolonged on the earth. Lord, if there's here tonight, there's some that have not kept that commandment. They would fall on their knees and ask you to forgive them. And go to their mom and go to their dad and ask their forgiveness. And say, I do want to honor you. I don't want my life to be cut short. I want the promise that my days will be prolonged on the earth. I don't want to end like Absalom. I don't want to end like Nadab and Abihu. I don't want to end like Hophni and Phinehas. God, speak to their heart. I pray that all of us would desire to live our life your way, not our way. That we'd live our life to the will of God, not to the will of our flesh. And that we'd make much of the Bible. That we would love your word by reading it and studying it, meditating on it, talking about it, having it up in where we see it each day. Where it permeates every area of our life. And people would know that we love God's Word. Help us to always make much of the Bible. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. I wonder how many folks here tonight would say, Preacher, God has spoken to my heart tonight. Appreciate you praying for me. If you just slip your hand up tonight, Christian, say pray for me tonight, Pastor. Amen. Amen. That's good. You may put them down. In a moment I'll pray. We'll have our invitation. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to Him tonight. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. God will start adding those days to your life, not subtracting them. Let's live as He wants us to live. Father, bless this invitation now. Thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. May Your will be done in each heart and life. I pray that each of us would respond to you this evening. Have thine own way, Lord, in our heart tonight. And I'll thank you for it.